Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Today we're going to, uh, we're going to continue in looking at Joseph. We've been looking at Joseph, and we'll, we'll look, we'll open our Bibles and get into Genesis chapter 40. Um, and then we're going to look at some, some other things related to the life of Joseph. The title of the message for today is Calm, Cool, and Collected. Calm, is that how it goes? Cool, calm, and collected? Calm, cool, and collected. Calm, cool, and collected. Anybody want to hear about that? Yeah. yeah. Listen, um, I'm excited about that. Before we get into uh, Genesis 40, I want to share something from the 91st Psalm. Let's look at the 91st Psalm. You know, I, I, you know, I woke up this morning and I was praying about the, just praying and spending my time with Jesus, talking to the Holy Spirit, and, and this is what he put in my heart for you. He says, a spirit, the spirit of cool, calm, and collected is going to come upon this church. A cool spirit, calm spirit, cool spirit, amen? The Holy Spirit, God's spirit, the spirit of God has a coolness about him, amen? And I believe that that's going to impact the, impact the members of this church. Cool, calm, and collected, amen? amen. So, you listen, you receive it by faith. You receive it by faith. You don't receive it when it makes sense. You don't receive it when it makes sense in your head. You receive it by faith, okay? If if he said it, then you're going to need it. Cool, calm, collected. A cool spirit is coming upon you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And understand this, you know, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of every believer. And what he's saying is that he wants to manifest the calmness in your life. He, want to man, he wants to manifest. Coolness is already a part of his character. It's already an attribute of his. Calmness is already an attribute of his. He wants to manifest it in your life. Do you understand that? He, want to, he wants to manifest this coolness, this calm, this collected. He doesn't want you to be the opposite of that. Anxious, in a hurry, frazzled, disturbed. There's a scripture in um, Ephesians chapter 2 that tells us that our relationship with God, our connection to him is undisturbed. We enjoy an undisturbed connection with God, meaning that no matter what's happening around me, I'm cool. I can be calm. I can be collected. I don't have to be frazzled. I don't have to be disturbed. You got that? Cool, calm, collected. And not just a, a natural, a natural mental coolness, but one that's in your spirit. It becomes a part of your character. See, when you have a, um, when, when you allow the Holy Spirit to manifest this attribute in you, your circumstances could be a mess. It could be a mess all around you, but because, but he wants to manifest his coolness in you. So even when, when situations affront you, you respond cool, calm and collected. I'm not moved by what's happening around me. I'm not distraught. I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be frazzled. It's not going to move me from my position of faith. I'm going to respond cool, calm, and collected. Do you understand that? That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. That's what he's declared already. He said a spirit of coolness is coming upon this church. Amen? Amen. Does that sound good or what? You excited about that or what? <laughs> you receive it now or you're going to wait till later? <laughs> Amen. Receive it then. Listen to this. From the 91st Psalm, I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. This is the 91st Psalm. This is in the Bible. It says, when you sit enthroned 
under the shadow of Shaddai or the shadow of the almighty, you are hidden in the strength of God most high. He's the hope that holds me and the stronghold to shelter me. The only God for me and my great confidence. He will rescue you from every hidden trap of the enemy. And he will protect you from false accusation and any deadly curse. His massive arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. You can run under his covering of majesty and hide. His arms of faithfulness are a shield keeping you from harm. You will never worry about an attack of demonic forces at night, nor have to fear a spirit of darkness coming against you. Don't fear a thing. Whether by night or by day, demonic danger will not trouble you, nor will the powers of evil launched against you. Even in a time of disaster, with thousands and thousands being killed, you will remain unscathed and unharmed. You will be a spectator as the wicked perish in judgment, for they will be paid back for what they have done. When we live our lives within the shadow of God most high, our secret hiding place, we will always be shielded from harm. How then could evil prevail against us or disease infect us? God sends angels with special orders to protect you wherever you go, defending you from all harm. If you walk into a trap, they'll be there for you and keep you from stumbling. You'll even walk unharmed amongst the fierce powers of darkness, trampling every one of them beneath your feet. For here is what the Lord has spoken to me. Because you've delighted in me as my great lover, I will greatly protect you. I will set you in a high place, safe and secure before my face. I will answer your cry for help every time you pray. And you will find and feel my presence. Even in your time of pressure and trouble, I'll be your glorious hero and give you a feast. You will be satisfied with full life. You will be satisfied with full life. You will be satisfied with full life. And with all that I do for you, for you will enjoy the fullness of my salvation. Ain't that good news? Amen. 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 We're grateful for that. Now, looking back at um, at Joseph, so we've been talking about, um, well, we started out talking about God's way of providing for us, God's systems of provision. And last week, last week's message title was, I'm not bragging, I'm just blessed. Amen. And um, what we find out in our lives is that there's some good things that are happening to you, good things happening for you. And, you know, you looking at it and you saying, you know, this really, I'm just the benefactor. I just benefit from this good. I understand that this good didn't originate with me. I'm not the doer of this good thing that's happening to me. I can't brag about this favorable situation I'm in. I ain't bragging. I'm just blessed. This is just what God said concerning me. Amen. So, you know, while, you know, haters going to hate, right? And, uh, while, you, while you're hating, let's understand this one thing. I'm just blessed. This is just the result of being blessed. Amen. And there's things that are happening in our lives that's just the result of being blessed. You chose the right team. <laughs> you chose to be on the right side. And you blessed by association. You've associated yourself with God Almighty. And because of it, there's blessings that's going to happen to you. There's favorable circumstances and situations that's going to come to you because you're blessed. Amen. Don't shy away from it. Don't be ashamed of it. Just understand that it's a part of your heritage. It's what you have inherited. Amen. Glory to God. And we looked at the life of Joseph and we saw how Joseph received dreams. But Joseph didn't. He didn't ask for the dream. He didn't ask for what was going to happen to him. It, this is just what God said. And as he went and shared it with people, people got jealous. His brothers, his family got jealous because of what he shared. 
But the truth of the matter is, it's not what Joseph said, it's what God said. Joseph was just sharing a dream. The dream is associated to the promise. God has given you a promise. And there are things that are happening in your life that are in association to the promise. There are good things that you'll experience that's connected to the promise. Listen, there, there are some... The scripture says that the weapons formed against us won't prosper, but understand that there are weapons that will form against you because of the promise. You understand that? But even in those situations, we don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid. Why? What does the song say? The Lord is my light and my salvation. I rest in him. I'm hidden in the shadow of the almighty. So even when evil comes against me, I don't have to be moved. I can stay cool calm and collected because God's got me. God has got my back. So I'm looking at the story of Joseph. I'm looking at this account. I'm looking at how he carried himself and how he lived his life. And it was no matter what situation he was in, Joseph remained cool. Joseph didn't turn away. Joseph never did Joseph speak ill concerning the people who mistreated him. Joseph didn't speak ill of Potiphar. Joseph didn't speak ill of Potiphar's wife who lied on him. He stayed cool, calm, and collected. Why? Because Joseph rested in the promise. Joseph rested. His expectation was in what God said. His strength, his strength, his endurance, he was able to persevere the things that he faced in life because of what God said. He stayed, he remained in position. He remained in a position of faith. He he kept his grip tight around what God said. No matter what he faced in life, no matter what came to affront him, his grip stayed uh, tight around the promise of God. He kept his expectation. Okay, and that's the same thing that we have to do. We have to find ourselves in that same place where I'm not allowing circumstances and situations to move me because I, I have a firm grip on my real circumstance and my real situation. My real circumstance is that I'm in Christ. My real circumstances that I'm found in him. My real situation is that my life is hid in him. My real situation is that I inherit his finished work. And because that is my truth, it doesn't matter what's happening around me. I know that God is true and everything in this man's world is a lie. That's the position that I remain. That's the stance that I take. Even as I face the things that affront me or come against me in this world, I can face it coolly, calm, and collected. I can keep my composure. I can remain in a stance and a place of faith because I believe God more than I believe these situations. I believe God's provision more than I believe in lack. Lack is a lie. That's the lie. God is true. God said I have all and abound. I believe that over I believe in sufficiency. I believe that I'm the healed, protecting my health. I'm healed by his finished work, by his stripes, I'm healed. I believe that over a a report from the doctor. Do you understand that? So no matter what I'm facing, I can stay cool, calm, and collected because I believe, I believe. I have so much, my belief in him is greater than what I'm being faced with, what I'm being challenged with in this world. I am a believer, amen? Go ahead and say that, I am a believer. I I say it again, I am a believer. believer. Say it like you are a believer. Say it again, I am a believer. believer. Not a doubter. doubter. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So we can be cool, calm, and collected. We don't have to allow the enemy. Listen, something else I wanted to share with you. Don't allow the enemy to rob you of your, don't allow the enemy to rob you of the reward of consistency. Don't allow the enemy to rob you of the reward of consistency. Consistency has a reward. Consistency, there's a reward to staying, to standing. There's a reward to standing. Black Friday's coming up. Right? I remember a few years ago, now I, I'll never do it again. I did it once, experienced it once, never had to experience it again. I went out, I believe I was with my mom. We went out to Best Buy one of, one of them Black Fridays. It was a long time ago. And um, man, we got there early in the morning. We thought we were early. Those people camped out already. 
You know how it is, right? But why do those people, and, and we've seen it on the news and seen it in reports, man, people get tents and they pitch a tent, literally, and it could be cold outside, it could be raining, but they have an expectation in mind. They're expecting for Best Buy or whoever it is, whatever company, Walmart, to come through on what they promised. And no matter the conditions, they remain. And the reward that they get from remaining is whatever they expected. And I'm telling you the same thing. We can use that as an example for us in the things of God. God has promised you. God has promised to reveal unto you his abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing and truth. That's God's promise to you. And what he's telling us to do is remain. Remain. Be consistent. Standing in the promise. If you're looking for me, you're going to find me standing in the promise. I'm going to remain. The conditions aren't going to change me. I'm not going to waver me. I'm not going to let the trends of the world move me. I'm not going to let the opinion of men move me. I'm going to remain. I'm standing here on this promise. And my consistency has a reward. Don't allow the enemy to move you. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to lose the reward of consistency, okay? Be consistent in the things of God. Be consistent in the things that God has called you to. Some of you, this year, you've tried new things. You stepped out in in ways that you haven't stepped out before, right? Don't allow the enemy. Don't allow carnal thinking. Don't allow conformity. Don't allow the trend of the world to get you to revert back to the way that you used to do things. Remain consistent. If you started a consistent track of being at church, remain consistent. Don't allow your conditions or circumstances to throw you. You got to stand up, be a big boy, big girl in the face of some things. Things come against you, but you got to make your determination that I've decided to do something. I decided to do this thing that God has put in my heart to do. And I'm not allowing I'm not allowing the circumstances and situations to get me off of what I decided to do. Maybe I need to do it in a different way. Okay, I ain't got no gas, so I'm going to call a ride. I'm going to get Uber, somebody. I'm going to be at church because that's what me and God said I need to do, and I'm not allowing situations and circumstances to move me from what I decided to do. There's a reward to consistency. There is a reward to consistency. The way that we said is that the consistency is the key to breakthrough. You're trying to break through some things, and the only way you're going to break through is by being consistent. That's the only way you hammer on that rock, hammer on that rock, hammer on that rock. Eventually, the rock is going to break. The speed of the rock breaking is determined by your consistency. It probably would have broke last week, but you took a break. I'm I'm just saying, you know. Don't allow the enemy to rob you from your consistency. Consistency has a reward. You stick to it. You stick to it. This year, the beginning of the year, God shared with us, Holy Spirit shared with me, and I shared it with you, that by the end of this year, we will have measurable results. We'll have measurable results. You'll know that you've grown. Things around you have grown, and that's in various ways, depending upon your situation. Some of you, you know, it'll be the growth you experience is in your, maybe in your personality, maybe in your character. There are some ways that you've grown. Maybe in your bank account, there are some ways that you've grown. Maybe in your responsibilities, in various ways, in accordance with the number of people that, that heard and received that word. But by the end of this year, we will have measurable results, Right? And there are adjustments that you've made this year. There's changes that you've made. Some of you, your car's never been cleaner than it has been these last few months. Stay consistent in that. Okay? Stay consistent in the things that God has put in your hand. Diligence. There's a reward to diligent. Be diligent. Don't allow situations to move you from diligence. Don't allow situations to get you to waver. There's a scripture in Ephesians chapter 4 that talks about people being tossed to and fro. The wind blows left and you flying left. The wind blows right and you fly right. No, be firmly rooted. Be planted. That's the only way a tree grows. Right? You go in the in the garden, you put something, you put a seed in the ground, the seed then begins to develop a root system. If you pull it out of the ground every day, it's not going to grow. Keep it down there. Keep it in the ground. Let it grow. Let it do what it's supposed to do. Same thing with you. Same thing with your faith. Same thing with your believing. 
receive the reward of consistency. Amen. 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 Receive the reward of consistency. Know that, you know, don't be moved. Sometimes I've heard people say, you know, the, really, the only thing the enemy can do is give you suggestions. The only thing the enemy can do is give you suggestions. It's smoke screens, smoke and mirrors. That's what it is. It's tricks. The Bible cautions us against the wiles of the enemy. It's just tricks, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> all of us can probably relate to times, you know, you're walking down the street, you hear a dog bark, and you jump. You don't see the dog, but the dog, you hear the, you hear the sound, and you jump. Now you look, you look, and you this itty-bitty thing, and you're like, Psh, you know, you brush it off because you see that it can't affect you. That's the same thing with the devil. You know, he's just barking making a bunch of noise. But if the scripture says that when we get to see him, we'll look at him and say, this the one? This little imp thing, this the one that tore down kingdoms, right? He's nothing. They just don't take the suggestion. Stay focused. Just keep on walking. Just keep on going. Amen. Just keep on going. Stay focused. Stay steady. The scripture in, 90, in the 91st Psalm says that we are hid in the arms, in the shadow of the Almighty. No matter what's going on around me, I know where I am. I'm hid in his arms. He's going to cover me. He takes care of me, okay? I'm going to trust that he's going to take care of me. I don't care what's happening in the, in the world. don't care what's happening in the economy. I don't care what's happening in the weather. He's going to take care of me. My God is faithful to take care of me, no matter what. You got it? He's going to take care of me. He's going to take care of my stuff. He's going to take care of my family. He's going to take care of my positions, my possessions. I don't have to worry or be afraid. I'm not going to be moved, but I'm going to remain in faith. Amen. Amen. We'll remain in faith. Um, Last week we ended, we looked at the life of Joseph and we saw that the only way that Joseph was able to endure the things that he, that he, that he went through was because he added faith to his work. Every day in his serving Potiphar, in his serving Pharaoh, in his serving even in the prison, he did it with the faith of what God promised. And that's the way that we should be working in our work. Everything that you do, everything that you do, everything that you do, this is something, you know, is near and dear to my heart because this is something that that I've practiced for many years. Everything that I do is not too far removed or that um, there's a shadow. I'll say it like this. There's a shadow hanging over everything that I do. The shadow of what God said I'm supposed to do is involved. It's hanging over everything that I do. Everything that I do, I can trace it back to what God said. Everything that I do, I do it in light of my calling, my assignment, the things that God has shown me. And I'm saying that you should operate the same way. Everything that you do should involve faith. Everything that you do, you should do it in light of what God has promised you. What has he promised you? You should every day, you should be aware of the promise. You should be aware of the things that God has said to you. You should be aware of the things that God said is going to happen in your life. You should be aware of the future that God showed that he has for you. You should be aware of the things that are manifesting in your life every day. And everything that you do, you bring it with you. Everything that you do, you bring it with you. Everything you do, you bring your faith with you. Everything you do, you bring the promise with you. In everything that you do, in your work, in your every day walking around life, you need to walk around every day carrying the promise with you, carrying faith with you. It needs to be involved in everything that you do. Therefore, nothing small, not, everything is important. There are no menial tasks. There isn't nothing that's beneath you. If it's an assignment that you're doing, when you do it with the promise in mind, then what you're doing is important. Amen. The assignment that I have today is important as I'm keeping what he's promised me in mind. Nothing's too small. Even what could be considered as the smallest thing becomes important because I do that small thing with the faith of what he's promised me in mind. Do you understand that? Don't despise the small things. Don't despise the small beginnings. Nothing is insignificant. Everything is important. The scripture says if we do anything minus faith, it's sin. Yep, I said a three-letter word. Everything that we do should have faith in it. Everything that we do should have faith in it. Everything that we do should be connected to the promise, should be connected to expectation. 
Every person that we meet, I know, and, and you know, I look over my life, there's some people, and I'll be honest with you, there's some people that I decided to do right. And the reason I decided to do right by them is because Holy Spirit shared with me is that this person could be a member of your church some years from now. Amen. You can't be mis do, you can't be doing folk wrong. Right? But I got the promise in mind. It saved me a lot of times. There's some places I can't go, things I can't do. This person, this person, you know, there's a situation where I'm like, man, nobody knows this person. Nobody knows this person. But the promise in mind says, no, you got to do this person right, because this person could be, you know, in your future somewhere. Everything that you do, you should have the same mindset. God's shown you something. God's shown you a future. God's shown you your way out. God's shown you deliverance. God's promised you things that happen in your future. You need to bring them the way that faith works. You bring what he's shown you in the future to your present. How do you do that? Because I act like it today. I'm not waiting for the end. I'm going to act like it today. I'm not waiting for, for prosperity. I'm prosperous right now today. So I act prosperous today. I talk prosperous today. I'm not waiting for healing to happen to me. He said, I'm healed. I'm acting like it today. Every, I'm going to do something that I couldn't do before. I'm expecting it today. I'm confessing it today. I bring my future. I bring the promise into my present by my own actions and my own confession. You can't tell me that this isn't how Joseph was thinking. How can you suffer the things that he suffered without faith? How can you survive your family, your family plotting to kill you? Your family plotting to kill you. And then the only thing that turned them from killing him was one of the the oldest brothers says, listen, let's at least get something out of it. If we kill him, we have nothing. We can sell him and at least get some money out of it. Put the boy in a pit, sell him to some travelers, some Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites pull him out of the pit, get him out of the pit, take him to Egypt. And he's sold again as a slave in Egypt. How do you overcome that? We, I mean, you get depressed because somebody don't respond to your email in a timely manner. I mean, come on. This man went through that and survived it, mentally survived it. I mean, and he, look, he came out like a champ because we see him in, in, in Potiphar's house serving with excellence. Never talked about Potiphar, never said anything negative about him. Potiphar's wife lies on him, says that he tried, he tried to rape me. That's what, he, that's what the lady told the husband. He tried to rape me. Joseph never spoke ill, Ill uh, um, ill words concerning her. Joseph didn't, didn't try to, you know, speak ill words concerning Potiphar when he made the decision to put him in the prison. What do we see Joseph do? He gets in the prison and keeps on with the excellent spirit to the point that now he's running the prison. How do you do that? Faith. That's the only way. Faith in the promise. I'm here in this prison. I'm here in the prison. I'm in prison. I ain't do nothing. I'm innocent, but I'm in prison. But I remember what God promised me. I have faith in what God promised me. If he said that he's going to set me up so I provide for my family, then, hey, that's what's going to happen. And even though I'm here in this prison, I believe in God in the prison. Oh, my goodness. So we see him get promoted, and the scripture says the Lord being with him, he prospered. Everything that he put his hands to prospered. And even though he was a slave and a prisoner, he's prospering. You can prosper where you are. It don't matter where you are. God will prosper you where you are because God is with you and he'll prosper whatever you put your hands on. Don't lose sight of what he's put in your hands. What's, What's in your hands right now is important. What's in your hands right now, don't cast off what's in your hands right now as insignificant. What's in your hands right now is important. What's in your hands right now is valuable. I had to learn at my mom's house that even though in this house all I got is a bedroom, 
But if I steward this bedroom, I'll learn what I need to learn to steward my own house. What's in your hands is important. My first car was a, was a, a 1991 Honda Accord. It was a 1991 Honda Accord, and I had it in 2001. So it was already 10 years old. I bought it. It had uh, over 100,000 miles on it. But it was the first car that I bought. I bought. I paid cash for it. Man, I took care of that car. That car was clean. The car was clean. I saved up my money. I got it repainted. Um, found somebody who was selling some, some rims. Remember TriStars? Back when TriStars, yeah, man. Found somebody, one of the neighbors was selling some TriStars at a low price. I bought them wheels, put that on that car. I was clean, man. That car was nice. I, but listen, I love Jaguar. I love Jaguar for as long as I can remember, right? Man, I took care of that Honda like it was a Jag. I did. With faith, I employed faith in everything that I do. Every car that I've owned, I'm taking care of it because I'm believing for a Jag, right? From the Honda to the Ford, all, all of them, all of them, right? You, you, this is what you have to do. You take the promise, the thing that you're expecting, and you bring it into your present through your actions and your speech. You don't wait for it to happen. No, I have to receive it like it's already done right now. I'm not waiting for my prosperity. I receive it like it's already done right now. I'm not, you know, you don't wait for nothing. You bring it into your present by your actions and your speech. Do you understand that? Whatever it is that you believe in God for, whatever it is that he's shown you, you bring it into your present by your own actions and your speech. I believe that this is what Joseph did. So he prospered in the palace. He prospered in, in um, I'm sorry, he prospered in Potiphar's house. He prospered in the prison. And let's look at um, Genesis chapter 40. Go to Genesis chapter 40. So practically, how do we do these things? How do we keep the right mindset? Well, Colossians chapter three, verse two tells us to set our minds and keep them set on what is above. So I'm constantly I'm thinking about the higher things. I'm thinking not on things that are on the earth, but I'm thinking about the things that prom that God has promised me. You understand that? I'm thinking about the higher things. If I would have known these things when I was out when I was in school, see, we, there are some high school students in here. If I would have known these things when I was in high school, then there would have been some things that manifested a lot quicker. If I would have known that I can treat my schoolwork, if I'm a faithful, if I can be faithful over this school assignment, the way that I can be, the way that I see myself being faithful over whatever it is that I want to do, business or whatever it is that I want to do, that I can bring that future into my present. Do you understand that? And I can be an excellent business person, even though I'm still in school. Because that's what God showed me, and I'm just going to bring it into my present through my actions and through my speech, through the way that I carry myself. Right? This is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 says, set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on things on this earth. And then verse 3 says, for as far as those, this world is concerned, you have died. And your new real life is hidden in Christ in God. You see that? So the work that I do in this natural is a reflection of where I am in the spirit. The work that I do naturally is a reflection of where I am spiritually. Man, that's good news. Did you catch that? The work that I do naturally is a reflection of where I am spiritually. Spiritually, I'm in Christ. Spiritually, I'm in a heavenly place. Spiritually, I'm, I'm in this glorious vision and the, the promise that God has given me. And I work because that I work my work today. My work in the natural represents where I am spiritually. You understand that the way that I approach my work today, the way that I approach my craft today is not a reflection of just what you see around me, but it's a reflection of where I am spiritually. This is where Joseph had to be in, in verse one of chapter 40. It says, now sometime later, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their Lord and they were thrown into the prison. Right. So there now Joseph is in the prison that he's managing and the, 
the Pharaoh's butler, Pharaoh's baker, they've been thrown into the prison too. Joseph has been given an assignment to take care of them, to serve them. Joseph is serving them every day. And, and the way that, that I can take this, looking at the context of this, Joseph served them in a way that pleased them. That most of the days that they were there, they were pleased, even though they were in the prison. Joseph is serving them and he's bringing pleasure to them. Their continence, their facial expression resembles that they are, shows that they are pleased. One day Joseph comes to them and he sees that their continence is down. They're saddened. They're depressed. And it had to be something that was not in the ordinary because Joseph recognized it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If they were sad and depressed every day, Joseph wouldn't have recognized that they were sad and depressed. So it must be that most of the time they were in good spirits. Then a day comes where they're not. And Joseph asks, why? What is going on? And they say that we've had dreams. We've both dreamed that we don't know the interpretation of these dreams. Joseph, because of his connection with God, he says, isn't God the giver of dreams? Joseph says, no problem. I can handle that. But why does Joseph say I can handle that? Because here Joseph is, he's serving. Joseph has placed himself in a position to meet the needs of other people. And Joseph says, you know what? I'm connected to a God that is the giver of dreams. You don't have to be down and depressed because you can't interpret it. My God is well able to. Joseph gives us an example of how we should approach life, how we should approach people, how we should approach even our workplaces. You know, we're in a, a, we're, we're in a we're, when you're, you know, doing your work, you're in a place, you know, um, the business that you that you you know work for or own or the organization that you're a part of. When they're faced with challenges, you, if everybody else is distraught and down and sad and depressed, you should be the only one that's upbeat, happy, and this ain't really no problem, right? Even if you if if you're in a position where you can be bold enough to say this ain't no problem because. I'm here and I'm connected to God. God can give a solution solution for this. God can show us the answer for this. At least God can give, you know, I worked in a school system. I worked in schools and, you know, there's some challenges there. And if nothing else, I resolved that I don't have to be distraught. The, if we can have a problem, it can be a situation. But the one thing that's not going to happen is I'm not going to lose my peace because of it. Even if I don't know the answer to it, I ain't going to be stressed out about it. And I'm a, I'll be an example for some other folk. You ain't got to be stressed out about it either. If the problem is that, too, is that big that we can't figure out the solution for it, the one thing that we don't have to do is be disturbed. Do you understand that? If that's the light that you give, then you shine that light. I mean, if you don't know the answer, but one thing I do know is that I ain't got to lose my peace and you ain't got to lose your peace over it. And we can have a problem and still have a good time. Amen. Shoot, I ain't about to have a problem and be depressed at the same time. If I can choose one, okay, the problem can stay, but I'm going to be happy. It's something. You are the light. Amen. You are hope in your place of employment or even as as an employer, you're hope. You provide hope. You're the source of hope. You're the source of light and understand and trust that you are anointed to bring solution. It doesn't matter where you are, what your position is. You're connected to God. He's got an answer. Sometimes his answer comes in just a different way to look at the problem. And you're there. You can be there to provide a different way to look at it. You understand that? So that's what Joseph, Joseph put himself in a position where he provides solution. Okay. Joseph interprets the dreams and most of you know how it went. You know, he told one of them that, you know, don't worry about this. Just after a little while, Pharaoh is going to forgive you for what you did and you'll be back serving him in the palace. And then he told the other person, I'm sorry, man, the end of this dream ain't ain't good for you. Um, You know, you're going to lose your head. But Joseph told him what it had to be told. Right. Joseph interprets the dream and he says to the I believe it was the bake, the cup bear, the cup bear. He says to the cup bear, listen, when you get out of here, just remember your boy. Right. Don't forget about me. And um, and it so turns that even even check this out. So the cup bear gets out, the butler gets out. He doesn't say nothing about Joseph right away. And maybe the situation doesn't present itself for him to say anything about Joseph right away. So Joseph is still in 
prison. But it never shows he never lost his hope. He's still in prison, still serving, still believing, still operating in faith. Time has passed. I believe it was 17 years, 17 years, 17 years. Okay, time has passed, but he's still expecting. He's still believing, still believing that what God said is going to happen is going to happen. When the opportunity presented itself, Joseph was ready. Pharaoh has a dream. He needs somebody to interpret the dream. The cupbearer finally remembers, oh, you know what? I met this guy in prison when I was on the yard, and and he can interpret dreams. He interpreted my dream, told me what's going to happen to me. I bet he can tell you what God is saying to you, right? And Joseph gets out of prison, and he's able to interpret the dream, and we know the rest. What I want to point out are some character traits that Joseph had going through this, right? He had perseverance, He persevered. He had unwavering faith. He believed. He believed in the promise. Okay, he remained in a position to serve. He didn't think it was little of him to serve. I mean, you can kind of say that Joseph was a prince at Jacob's house. Joseph was a prince at his daddy's house. But now he is a prisoner and he's a slave. But that doesn't throw him off. He puts himself in a position to serve other people. And really, if you want to boil down everything that Joseph did, Joseph did everything in service to other people. Why did he prosper in Potiphar's house? Because he was serving other people. Why did he prosper in the prison? Because he was serving other people. Why did he why was he able to interpret the dreams of the the butler and the cupbearer and the baker, uh, the, the baker? Because he was serving other people. Never leave the position of a servant. No matter what your position is or your title is or how long you've been doing it or your tenure, remember that you are a servant and then you are a servant connected to God. So you're well able to provide quality service to anybody that comes into your presence. You're well able. You understand that? Joseph was promoted. Joseph prospered. And I believe the foundation of his stability, the foundation of his strength. The reason that he was able to persevere, the reason that he was able to endure is because he stood on the promise. He was unwilling to let go of the promise. Do you understand that? And that's the place that we have to find ourselves. You need to ask yourself, what promise do you stand on? What promise do you stand on? Because I'm telling you, the winds are going to blow. The waves are going to rise. People will say bad about you. What promise do you stand on? What promise do you stand on? Money will fail you. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says money, 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 sometimes money acts like it has wings. You look, it's there one day and then it just flies away. Money will fail you. But what promise do you stand on? What promise do you stand on? This doesn't need to just be some, you know, arbitrary question that the preacher asks, but this is something that I need to really grab and know for myself. I need to know what promise I stand on. I need to know that when things come against me or even in the mess that I'm in right now, what am I standing on? What am I standing on? What did God say to me that I'm not willing to I'm not going to move from this place? Because if I if I can't find a ground to stand on, then I'm subject to being moved and tossed to and fro. But if I'm believing God for some stability in my life, then I can find myself planted in the promise of God. I'm not moved because I know that God said. I'm not moving because I know what God said. I'm not moving because I know what God said. I'm not bothered because I know what God said. I know what he promised me. I know what he showed me. I'm going to endure because I know what God said. Hey, my goodness. (laughs) I can make tough decisions because I know what God said. Pastor Brian taught a message last Wednesday. He said, even though, even when you, what did he say? Even when you got to let go, you're not losing. Why? Because I know what God said. Even if I got to, if it seems like I'm losing because I had to let go of some things. But I ain't losing because I know what God promised me. Oh, my goodness. That's good news. 
I know what God promised me. There's some decisions. There are some times that I had to make some decisions. And, you know, I had to firm. My decision is grounded in the promise. I don't care what the situation looked like. It might look bad. It might look bad to other people. But I ain't even caring about the situation because I know what God said. There were days that I had to drive. I drove to Tampa with no gas. I said, either God is supernaturally going to get me to where I need to go. Because the only thing I knew, I know my assignment, and I know I need to be in church. So I'm going. I've made that decision. You ain't moving me from that decision. I'm going. Now, what happens in between where I am and me getting there, I don't know. But I know I'm going. And I just believe God's going to make a way. And if I got to supernaturally get there because he expands these gas fumes then he's going to do what only he can do. And if I get on 275 and I run out of gas, thank God for the road warrior. Some of y'all know what a road warrior is. But one thing is certain. I'm going to make it to where I'm supposed to be because I'm standing on his promise. If I got to let go of some stuff, no problem. I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Because I got the promise. Glory to God. You want to put me at this entry level position, even though I'm qualified to run this whole thing? No problem. I'll take the entry level position because I know what God said. You want to demote me? No problem. Go ahead and do what you feel you need to do. But I know what God said. I'm not worried about anything else because I'm the promise is more real to me than anything that I see. The promise is so real to me. How do you get yourself in a position where the promise becomes that real? It's by what you're thinking about. What are you meditating on? Who are you allowing to speak to you? Who are you listening to? Spend more time with God and talking about the promises than you spend time with all these other folk talking about the mess that happens in this world. Amen? Amen. My goodness, that's good stuff, ain't it? I got a lot more to talk about. Let's see how we do this. So and I, I'm trying to get out of this. You know, this 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 message about Joseph was connected to um, God's system of provision for us. We're looking at God's ways of providing and we understand that God has given us a supernatural system, a spiritual system. But he also God gave us the natural system and the real spiritual person is proficient in both systems. I'm not so spiritual that I only focus on what's happening in the spiritual and I neglect this natural realm. No, I'm spiritual, so I'm going to do what I do spiritually, but I'm also going to do what I need to do in this natural world, too. So I'm going to sow my seed and lay up treasures for heaven, and I'm going to work with diligence because both of them could bless me. That's what Ecclesiastes chapter 11 says, right? So God has given me both systems and the life of Joseph represents a person who worked the natural, even though he was spiritual. He had a promise from God, but that promise impacted what he did naturally. Do you see that? He was excellent in his work. He was promoted and he prospered. Not. Be- Listen, I'll say it like this. He wasn't promoted and prosperous because of what he had spiritually. He was promoted and prosperous in a natural system because he allowed what he had spiritually to impact what he did naturally. Because he had the promise, he worked in excellence and his excellent work prospered him. And that's where we need to be. Do You understand that? God has given us both systems. OK, now we're going to move into looking at this supernatural system, the spiritual system that God has given us. Because you know, as a believer, we are children of the supernatural. When you got born again, you chose Jesus as your Lord. You were born again. But like Jesus told Nicodemus, they ain't talking about you entering once again into your mother's womb to have a natural birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. You've been quickened in your spirit. I'm alive spiritually. I am not, according to Ephesians chapter 2, around verse 11, it says we're not mere humans. I'm not a mere man. I'm a born again man. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm a supernatural. You need to say that. I am supernatural. I'm spiritual. I'm a spiritual being. 
having a natural experience. You're children of the supernatural. Galatians chapter 4, I believe it is. Galatians chapter 4. We'll look at this. And I'm moving towards closing. I'm moving towards the end. But I want to get, get past these things so that we can enter into December, close out this year real, real strong, and uh, prepare us for what God is going to do in 2019. Amen? Amen. So y'all all right? Yeah. If you feel yourself, hey, listen, part of the, the you know, if you're, if you're home, people who, who, you know, stream at home, when they get sleepy, ain't nobody there to nudge them. They just end up falling asleep on the message. But here, you know, you got a partner, you got a neighbor next to you. So if you feel a little drowsy, you know, trust your neighbor, give you a little elbow and wake you up. Amen. Amen. In Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse number 22 from the Amplified, it says this. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, right? One by the bondmaid and one by the free woman. But whereas the child of the slave woman was born according to the flesh and had an ordinary birth, the son of the free woman was born in fulfillment of the promise. Now, all of this is an allegory. These two women represent two covenants. One covenant originated from Mount Sinai, talking about Moses and the law. And then he talks about the other covenant Um, in verse 28. I'll skip down to verse 28. It says, but we, brethren, are children not by physical descent as was Ishmael, but like Isaac, born in virtue of the promise. And what he's saying there, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, so God promised Abraham a seed, a son, a child. In root to the promise being fulfilled, Abraham and his wife made this plan to do it their way. So Ishmael was born through natural means. Ishmael was born from a man and a woman getting together and having a baby. That's natural means. But Isaac, Isaac was born. Isaac's birth represented only what God can do. Because both Abraham and Sarah were beyond the years to bear children. So Isaac represents the power of God, the ability of God, supernatural birth, right? And then what Paul is telling us is that We take that story, bring it into our present. Now, whose children are you? And Paul is saying that you are children of the supernatural. You're children of the promise. You weren't born. You cannot trace your birth back to natural means. There's a scripture that says that we are the people who can't trace our birth back to human means. We are spiritual. We've been born again. You are a spiritual person. You understand that? You're children of the supernatural. So as children of the supernatural, don't settle for natural means. As children of the supernatural, super meaning above or above and beyond, up, up and away, super, superman, super, children of the supernatural, I don't have to settle for natural, even though I work within the natural. What happens in this natural realm, I'm not subject to because I am supernatural. Even though I work with this natural system, the natural system is subject to me. I'm not subject to it. So I can work in a natural system and get supernatural results because I'm a supernatural person. You understand that? So even though we work, we go to work, we have jobs, we have businesses, we have occupations, we're a part of organizations, and all of those things are natural, but I'm supernatural in this natural. So I don't have to settle. I'm not subject to the natural course of things. I trust in supernatural. So where it took another person four years to learn what they needed to learn, I can learn it in less time because I'm supernatural, and I can download my insight from heaven if need be. Do you understand that? Where everybody else, because of the depression and, and the market is going down, so everybody else is bailing out and losing their resources, I can still prosper even in a famine because I'm connected to supernatural and I'm not subject to this natural system. 
even though I don't have a degree and they say that I need a degree and I need to know these things in order to prosper because I'm not subject to that system. I can prosper even out without the degree because I got the wisdom of God and I tap into the supernatural. Do you understand what I'm saying? Glory to God. OK, I'm going to go through this. All right. Y'all got 10 more minutes for me. Yes. I'm just going with that one person. One person. So it's me and you. The rest of y'all, y'all free to do what you're going to do. But me and that one person that said, yes, this is us. We in this together. Amen. Listen, so we're children of the supernatural. The, the Bible, Bible account that I want to use to illustrate this is in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. In 1 Kings chapter 17, starting at verse number 8. 1 Kings 17, starting at verse number 8. They got it. It says this, And the word of the Lord came to him. This is talking about the prophet. Okay? The word of the Lord came to him. See, there's the key. This is the first place that you have to stand. The first place that you have to stand. Your starting place is what did God say? That's the place you start. The starting line for you is what did God say? And listen, this is the beauty, beauty in covenant relationships. The beauty in being associated with a, a valid vision is that I don't have to, even when I feel like I haven't heard from God, I have heard from God because I connected to a ministry that hears from God. And even though when I think I don't have a vision for my life, my church has a vision. So what did God say to me? God said to me, Jeremiah 33 and 6. What did God promise me? God promised that he's going to reveal his abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. That's what God promised me. That's my starting place. That's where I'm going to start. See, the prophet started with a word of the Lord. You understand that? There's no prosperity without instruction. Ooh, glory to God. That's good. So in verse number nine, it says, God said to him, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and dwell there. See, some people won't prosper because they won't go where God is telling them. The beauty in having a supernatural relationship is that I have supernatural partnership. So I'm not journeying in this life alone. I'm not subject to just what I know in my mind, but I am I've been opened up to the mind of God. And even when I'm in famine, like this prophet was in a place where there's famine, his, the brook that he was near, the brook dried up. So he was in famine. But the instruction that he received from his supernatural partner, God, God says, go to Zarephath. You understand that? We have to learn how to follow directions. <laughs> right. So some people don't prosper because they won't go where God is telling them or they go partially. Right. But you show up or inconsistently, but fully go into what God is telling you to do. Give yourself to what God has called you to. If God has told you to go to a certain brook, give yourself all the way. Show up all the way. Listen, you are not present if you leave some of you somewhere else. You're only present if you bring all of you. You hear that? In verse number 10, he says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. So Elijah is leaving the brook where he was miraculously provided for. He was the scripture says that he was read by ravens. Birds brought him meat. It wasn't pretty. But it got the job done. <laughs> OK, sometimes God call us to things and call us and put us in positions and it might not be pretty. It might not be what we exactly image in our, made up in our own minds, but it's provision coming. Oh, glory to God. So God, he's leaving. He's leaving a place of miracle and he's going to another place of miracle. You see that? Verse 11 says, as she was going to I skip something. Verse 10 says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was gathering sticks there. Ain't it beautiful that when he got there, the person he was looking for was there, too. That's the beauty about obedience. That only happens when you're obedient. When you move Where God is telling you to move, when God is telling you to move there, there's always something on the other side. There's something on the other side. God is orchestrating your life. We read over and over again, Ephesians chapter 2. This ain't no accident. I'm just not walking through this life. But God has pre-planned some stuff for me. And as I walk this life, there's some stuff that I run into because my God already set it up for it to be there before I even started this journey. You understand what I'm saying? 
So he gets there, and the woman that he needs to meet is right there at the gate. And he calls to her and tells her, bring a morsel of bread in your hand. See, don't overlook what's in your hand. What was in her hand started it all. Don't overlook what's in your hand. God can anoint what's in your hand. God God can multiply what you have. Verse 12 says, and she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have not a loaf baked, but only a handful of meal in the jar and a little oil in the bottle. Don't despise small things. She says, see, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and bake it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. She had a small vision. Get rid of your small vision. Get rid of your, look to the person next to you and tell them, get rid of your small vision. Start thinking beyond you. See, she had to expand her vision. She's just thinking about she got enough for all she said was I got enough for me and my house. But you need to start thinking beyond your house. You need to start thinking about the neighborhood. If God's going to increase you, he just going to, he, he just don't want to, the scripture says that he's going to run us over, overflow us. You don't need overflow just for you and your house. We're going to change the whole city, impact all Pinellas County. You understand that? So I need overflow. Amen. First thing that she had to do was expand her thinking. It's not just for you and your son, but you need to provide for somebody else. Verse 13 says, Elijah said to her, fear not, get rid of fear, get rid of fear. That's what you need to do. Get rid of the fear. OK, go and do as you have said, but make a little cake of it first and bring it to me. Where's your priority? What are you thinking about first? The difference between being need minded and seed minded is where you what do you put first? She was need minded. When Elijah met her there, she was need minded. She was thinking about what her and her son needed. Elijah, through his conversation, turned her to being seed minded. The first thing that you need to do is sow some seed. Think beyond you. There's no reason for God to increase you to keep doing what you've been doing. If God's going to put prosperity on you and increase you so you can do things that you aren't doing yet. That's what increase is. Increase comes with increase. Ain't no reason to increase you to do what you've been doing. All these people want to lump some of money to keep doing what they've been doing. No, if God is going to increase you, he's going to also increase your responsibility. (laughs) He says he wants to grow you so that you be like a tree. You can provide shelter for not just you and your family, but many. You understand that? So God, Jesus, Elijah, (laughs) all of them working together had to get the lady to stop being need minded and be seed minded. Right. And he tells her not to be afraid. First, prepare the cake for me. Afterward, prepare some for yourself and your son. You see that? Verse 14 says, for thus says the Lord. This is good. For thus says the Lord. That's where we need to find ourselves. For thus saith the Lord. There's some situations that we're facing right now. We need to look at the situation and say, for thus saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord. If God said it, that settles it. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal shall not waste away or the bottle of oil fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. You understand what he's saying? He's saying, I'm going to give you provision right now with what you have. And I'm going to carry this provision to your next place of provision. That's the type of God that we have. He's a thorough God. God never gives you just enough, but he always wants to give you more than enough. God says, I'm going to take what you have and I'm going to miraculously expand it until it rains. The rain represents provision. So I'm going to take you to this. I'm going to take you from this place of provision to the next place of provision. I got it all covered. God's got it all covered. Amen. Verse 15 says she did as Elijah said. This is her faith. She acted on what the man of God said. Some people make no plans to act. Some people collect a notebook full of notes, but they never get to doing Her provision came as she acted on what the man of God said. That was her faith. You understand that? Glory to God. And she and he, oh goodness, she and he and her household ate for many days. Now, like this, he ate, she ate, her household ate. See, sometimes we fail to realize that there are other people depending upon our faith. I'll let that sink in a little bit. 
See, she took an act of faith that didn't just provide for her, but her act of faith provided for the man of God and her whole household. There are other people depending upon your faith. Your faith can change the condition of your children's lives. You entering into what God promised you can set your children up to live a life that you can't even imagine right now. It's your faithfulness and your commitment to the things of God that can bring other people out of darkness into light. So even when it comes to the things of God, don't get selfish on it and think just what God's going to do from you. Yes, God's going to deliver you, but him delivering you is going to impact other people. The faith of this woman provides for the man of God and her whole household, ate for many days. Verse 16 says, the jar of meal was not spent, nor did the bottle of oil fail, according to the word which the Lord spoke through Elijah. Oh, that's good stuff. How much of what you do is hinged upon what the Lord said? How much of what you do is hinged upon what the Lord said? said. Amen. Amen. We'll end right there. If you receive something from that, give God some praise. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory to God. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word GIVERTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.